Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So what a tremendous honor to have you on the show. You are uh, John Danaher's first black belt, correct? I am. Actually, I met Johnny in 1998. He was a purple belt. He wasn't teaching. Uh, the people that were teaching at the time were Sean Williams, who's in Tennessee now and announces, Nick and Matt Sarah. And Johnny would sit on the side. I was a white belt. He was a purple belt. He had just gotten his purple. And I was there about a month. And he said, hey, kid, come over here. I want to tell you something. And he showed me something. Next day, I went through the academy. I submitted everybody what he, what he showed me. And that was the beginning of our friendship and my relationship with him. And he's my teacher. And in 2005, he gave me my black belt. No one knew what his name was at the time. I just uh, was incredibly loyal to him and uh, taught me the game and such a deep understanding of it. Uh, he's amazing. I, I just feel like he's the Einstein of BJJ. If anybody knows Johnny, most people don't, but just a small example of who he is. He's read the Quran. He's read the Bible. He's read the Torah multiple times. He can quote passages, knows it inside and out, all three, but he's an atheist. How ironic, right? And uh, he read his favorite book over 200 times, a Greek mythology book. book is about 900 pages, over 200 times. I'll give you some other little tidbit. Probably in about 2001 or two, Johnny had started really teaching me the game. And um, back then, there were no DVDs. I know it's hard for young people to believe that uh, YouTube didn't exist and social media did not <laughs> exist. And there were things called VHS tapes. Funny thing, I have a daughter. And not too far, long ago, we were walking out of the house and there was a VHS tape on the floor and the film had been pulled out. And she looked down and she said, what is that? I said, it's a VHS tape. And she said, but what is it? And I just, you know, the small things that as you grow up, you kind of thought, I thought everybody knew what that was. But um, just so that you know how his mind works is he had this VHS tape that somebody had kind of gotten put together underground. VHS tape was eight hours long. He wanted me to watch it. It was eight hours of Hicks and Gracie rolling. And it was grainy and it, was, it wasn't it was like this uh, edited version. It was like two minutes of him rolling and sometimes you couldn't tell who he was and there was no sound and just a montage of tape. Sometimes you had no idea. It was so black and white and a mixture of stuff. And he kind of was testing me like, what did you see in this? What did you see in that? And that's how Johnny is. Like Gordon's success isn't an accident. It's just not. And uh, so Johnny was kind of asking me a lot of questions. And I, I realized like how deeply he knew this tape. And uh, I said, John, how many times have you watched this tape? And he said, I think over 40 now. And if you think about 40 times eight hours, that's probably about five hours of your work week doing that for eight hours a day. I got to see it with GSP when George, uh, nobody knew who George was. And he said to me, hey, there's this kid that keeps driving down from Montreal in this old car. And he works as a sanitation worker in Montreal. He wants to be a fighter. And I said, oh, what do you want to do with him? And he said, I want to teach him. I like him. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, meet me tomorrow. We're going to start teaching him. And I'll tell you George, why George is a champion also, but probably about, I forget what year this was. This was even before he fought uh, Jason Mayhem Miller. Even before he fought him, like no one knew who George was. And uh, Johnny started teaching him. And the reason I bring it up is that Johnny would watch hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and know every tendency so deeply. It was, he's the best game planner in the sport. If you're around him, I know people, uh, there's two versions of Dan Johnny. There's one uh, that they see on these podcasts. There's one that the Academy knows that uh, if you've been to the Academy, you know he's a little bit different. And then there's the one that you might meet in person and he could be very charming and stuff. He's an incredible, has an amazing work ethic and doing research. And uh, I was watching a podcast. I don't get to see Gordon or the young kids anymore because they all moved away. But um, I was watching Gordon on Joe Rogan and he was mentioning how Johnny would go, go home and search for hours and hours and hours of footage and then come back and show the footage of this person replicating this move that he was trying to explain. His work ethic is insane. I, I feel very blessed that, that just randomly, like I met this guy and, you know, he taught me the game and such a deep understanding that, of it. Before Gordon and these guys came up, that many people know the Blue Basement. There were other people besides me, but you came into the blue basement. We were Johnny's crew. Like guys didn't compete. They just loved to roll. They had a passion for it. And that's how that built up. Like it just started to build. And then Eddie Cummings came and then Gary came and then Gary brought this young kid and that was uh, Gordon. And then Gordon brought Nikki and just started to grow. And thankfully Johnny has been credited for so many things now because he's devoted his life to it. 
So help me understand then, were you at, um, you were at the Blue Basement, we should uh, preface, this is Henzo Gracie Academy in New York, prior to even Danaher arriving, or were you there as a, a GI student also under Henzo, or how did that work when you fell under uh, John's tutelage? Uh, Johnny wasn't a teacher, he was a student also. So you guys were peers for a while then? And I, I never considered him a peer, I considered him a mentor, but he was a fellow student. And then shortly after is when everybody left. But at one point, Ricardo was the teacher, Ricardo Meda. And Ricardo left. And then Matt and Rodrigo Gracie wanted to do their own school in Long Island. So they stopped coming less. And then Nick Sarah went out there also. And that's when some of the next crew came up, which was Sean Williams and John Danaher. They became teachers. An insanely deep bench. It's it's just insane. Yeah, yeah what uh, yeah. Henzo's has uh, produced. If I could say something to, uh, it's an homage to uh, Master Henzo because people don't understand like what he's meant to the sport. You know, BJJ, and I don't want to mess this story up, but most people don't know that BJJ is named BJJ because of him. Because when he first came to New York, Greg Kukuk was here, and he brought Henzo, and Henzo was a brown belt. I, who's the guy in California? Is it Horion, the one that started the UFC? Yes. They were going to sue them because they wanted to use the Gracie name. So when he first came to New York, even though it was Henzo's last name, he wanted to use the Gracie name and they were gonna sue them. It was gonna be called Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And then that's how they decided, well, we can't use the name, I guess, they, whatever, for whatever legal reasons at that time. But that's how that became called BJJ, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> Crazy story. Your background's really interesting because you played the gi for quite some time, and now you are the head no gi instructor at Henzo's. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, I play at Henzo's uh, because I started in 1998. Everybody did the gi. It was no gi really wasn't a thing. Like zero, just wasn't a thing. No gi was for one time a week, and that was on Fridays. So about for the first five years, maybe maybe less, maybe about the first three and a half years, I never took the gi top off, and no one did. Uh, just on Friday afternoon, there were a few pioneers. They were coming up trying to fight because UFC really was nothing like that. None of that stuff existed back then. It was just in its pioneer stages. Even though it started in 93, it was like, wasn't like what it is now. And uh, Henzo was fighting in pride uh, with Hickson. And, you know, we used to do the Nogi class one time, sometimes two times a week. That was it. But my knowledge of, of Nogi is really, really deep. Like I, I came up under Johnny. We, the how the no gi started at Henzo's, uh, because it's produced so many champions. Like, I mean, at one time, like you went in there on, on Monday afternoon, you had Frankie Edgar, Eddie Alvarez, Gordon. I mean, you just was the cream of the crop of the sport. And I'm just naming a few. Like you walked in there, it was just cream of the crop. With the no gi, how that started at Henzo's was, it's funny because you mentioned Carl Provick earlier. So this room, if you want some history on how this all occurred, there was a gentleman who couldn't make the morning class. We used to have this afternoon class every day, and that guy couldn't make it. So he asked Sean Williams if he could do a private, like a private thing with him and Carl at 7.30 in the morning. And they used to, those two used to try to convince me to go. And I would think, are you crazy? Like, who the hell's going to do, who's going to roll at 7.30 in the morning? No way. And meanwhile, if you come to my Nogi class, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7.30, and anybody that's ever visiting New York wants to visit a blue basement, it's with welcome arms. We're not, I'm not here to try to get anybody beat up or anything. It's always come. I love BJJ. I'm passionate about it. Consumes my world. It's my passion. So anytime anybody's visiting, you want to come in on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I got 100 people in there rolling. And it's all levels from world champions to people just starting out. Uh, so it's packed. It's like as many people as you'll see on a, on a, in a mat at one time rolling all together and super cool. Like I play music. It's a great environment. But going back to how that started was those two guys paid Sean to do a private Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And they would ask me to come and I'd go... I'm not doing that. And, and then they would bug me and bug me and bug me. So then another guy went and then it became another guy and they would bug me so much. And then Sean wanted to relocate to California. So he asked Johnny to take over the class. And then, so Johnny takes over the class and then I agree to go. Because at that point, Johnny was my teacher. So if Johnny's gonna be there, I'm gonna be there. 
So I started going in the morning and then that's how that grew. It grew from five people to eight people to 20 people. And, and then, you know, became over the years, just became what it is, the DDS squad and new wave. And, but that's how that started. So going back to your question about Gi and Nogi, probably in about 2000 and I think we moved to the new, new place that where we are now, because we used to be on 30, 38th street. Um, now we're on West 30th between 7th and 8th. If anybody's ever visiting, there was another guy. So sometimes on podcasts, you'll hear this guy referred to and his name is Boris. So there were three of us that were like the kind of the back then it was, I'll tell this story in a second. It was one of the worst run businesses in America, but I'll tell that story in a second. But Boris used to wrestle and he wrestled at Hofstra. So he didn't like putting on the gi. So we used to do two days gi and one day no gi. And in about 2000, I have to say it's probably about 2004 because I got my belt in 2005, my black belt. So in like 2004, Boris came to me and said, hey, you mind if we do a vote? And I go, what kind of vote? And he goes, why can't we just do without this top all the time and these pants? I'm sick of this. So I said, I personally don't care. I said, let's get everybody in the room. We'll raise hands. And that's how the Nogi class started. We raised our hands. We were like, let's take this stuff off. Let's just roll. So in 2004, my primary focus became Nogi. And um, and then that's how I came up, you know, helping John Lee George. We used to fly to Montreal. And Johnny, you know, was his coach. And this is even, people don't, like, for us, the hobby wasn't in the picture. Like, there were other people in the picture. For us, came up late like, after. And there was some issues when, when Matt fought him for the championship and stuff. So there was some drama that went on. It had to get worked out. But that's how that started. And the reason I said earlier about it being the worst run business in America was that if you, because you came into the morning class back then, I don't allow this now, but it, back then, if you came into the morning class, we knew who was new. I mean, this was in the pioneer stages. There weren't schools all over America in every single state, every single country. Like, it wasn't like that. So you you could you had two places to roll when you came to New York City. You had Fabio Clemente's on 14th Street, or you came to Henzo's. Only two places you could go. Didn't exist anywhere else. So when you, we knew a new face. So the moment you came in with a new face, I was kind of like the leader of the little tribe there, if you want to call it. So I would give one of these guys a look. Then I'd give another guy a look, and you were targeted. You weren't going to get out of there without getting mauled, literally mauled. And feet to floor were a requirement. So I understand why they did it. Basically, because back then people were, you know, what's better, Kung Fu or Taekwondo? or So you'd get these guys coming in from different arts. They kind of wanted to see if this jujitsu was real. So the only way to prove it was like to annihilate them to a point where it's like, even if you were, could withstand the first guy, by the time you got to guy number three and four, they were fighting you like it was life and death for them. Like there was no tapping. Like you were on a full out war to kill this kid or whatever, man, kid, whatever you want to call it. So I always say to myself, I always say, God, what a terrible, bi- what a terrible business model. You're literally <laughs> totally. like killing yeah. him so bad that yeah. he, re- he doesn't want to come back to the point yeah, yeah. where it didn't matter if it was like your first day, <laughs> you were going to get killed. Yeah. And uh, so I laugh about it now looking back, but I under- understood like they wanted to prove the art so badly and what its effectiveness so they, I guess you could say it worked out because the sport is everywhere now. It's, it's awesome to see. In the beginning of uh, our conversation, you asked, how'd you get into jujitsu? And mm-hmm. I noticed that you uh, asked this of other people. And uh, I'm curious, why do you ask that? I always find it interesting uh, how somebody finds it. I heard this uh, comment one time about Bitcoin because Bitcoin has gone from like at times in the 60,000s to the 10,000s. And and I I heard this comment one time, somebody said to another, you get in when you get in. And uh, so I was like, oh, that's kind of cool saying, like whether you believe in crypto or not, irrelevant. I just thought the answer was interesting because that's how BJJ is. The game for me, I understand it revolves around fighting, but it has absolutely nothing to do with fighting for me. It's a form of like physical chess. It's a form of meditation. It's a form of spirituality. It's a form of bonding with some of the best friends you'll ever meet in your life. Like there's so many other things that come out of this art that are so beautiful. So I'm always curious of how that person's journey started. And that journey, that journey just never ends. Like, I, I, Johnny would probably get angry at me for saying this, but one time he said to me, and if you know John's mind, like, he's, he really knows the game. Like, he just knows the game inside and out. And he can quote every judo and wrestling champion and their favorite. His mind on stats is just 
it's off the hook. Whatever he reads, he can memorize. And he said to me, he said, can I talk to you? And he probably won't admit to this and he won't remember. He said, I feel like I suck at this game. And I was thinking to myself, God, I've never met anybody who knows more about the game. And I still think that. Like, it, and it's like, so beautiful of the art is like, you never stop learning. Whether it's your perspective and how to teach it, how to interpret a different move how to vocalize it to somebody else. Like you never stop learning. So I always find it interesting and in how this journey started for each individual. So I asked. What makes a great student? Oh man, that's a great question. Actually, there's a young man that's leaving. He actually left yesterday to head out to Austin to train under John. I've had him from white to blue. Now he got a job offer out there. And I said to him, I wish every student was like you. And he said, you mean that, Co- coach? And he said, nice thing. We had some interaction. And what I meant by is like, he was humble, always with a thought, always came in looking to seek knowledge, always looking to hear the perspective of the teacher. Whether he agreed with it or not, I don't know. Hopefully he did. And if he didn't, I loved that his mind thought, but he was humble enough to sit and listen. Being a good training partner, tapping when you know you should, being a tr- good training partner and that you drill and show a good work ethic to others. Because I feel that sometimes... Uh, And if you ever come to my room and you train in my room, I don't let senior guys or super advanced guys not drill, like, uh, period. You know, I'm on that. You're drilling. If you're not going to drill, I tell them, get the hell off the mat. Because I don't want you to be a a negative influence on the young guys that think that that's cool. You don't rise on the day of the fight. You revert back to the level of your training. So a person that's a good student is a person that drills, is humble, is accepting of, of listening. I've seen this many times that I told this young man when he was heading out there, I said, when Johnny tells you something, you say, yes, sir. You don't say, well, I was thinking, professor, and I was, you haven't won anything. You're not a world champion. You've never accomplished anything in the sport. So when you're saying that, well, I was thinking I should do this and I should, your professor's been there a bit longer than you. Listen to his perspective. Maybe you might incorporate it in your game. Maybe you might not. You'll decide that as your journey goes, there are going to be things you adopt and things you drop. But be humble, have a good work ethic, to try to keep consistent as you can. It's not the fastest guy, the strongest guy that wins the long distance race. It's the gentleman that dives deep into the detail and has that work ethic to deal with the grind. Uh, no one ever sees what happens behind the scenes when the lights are off and they're drilling for hours and hours and hours. Whether people like Gordon or not, and I know there's always controversy about some people like him, some people don't, but I think he's very good for the sport because he's brought so much attention to it. Uh, no one ever saw what that young man did when the lights were off. A young man would take an hour and a half ride to get there at 6.30 in the morning. Like No one ever saw that. The hours he'd spend drilling, the hours he'd spend watching a senior guy, like no one ever sees that. His success is not an accident. So whether you like the other stuff he does or not, and I always have, I have friends on both sides of it. They go, oh, he's a jerk. And some are like, oh man, he's the best. And whether it doesn't matter. What I tell you is behind the scenes with that young man, his work ethic is just unparalleled. I've seen, I used to coach UFC a lot, MMA guys, the ones that succeeded at the highest level. I would spend so much time with them. No one understood their work ethic. So for a young student coming up, I recommend that you uh, deal with the grind. Unfortunately, it is a it is a grind, but it's reflective of life. It's like life, uh, Henzo one time on a 60-minute podcast, he said that the best thing a man could have in his soul is the will to fight. That's true. It's that will to like deal with the grind and and push through. And I think that's one of the attributes that over years and years that wrestlers and BJJ players develop on this journey to get to black. Conversely, what makes a great instructor? Oh, man, Uh, there's two different ones. There's one that's this positive energy and positive influence for young people that has patience to teach uh, what they know. And then there's the other one. You know, there's the one that's uh, that's so understanding of the game that nothing is by accident. That's how I was taught the game is that every detail matters where each where each hand is, where your head placement, how your head is tilted, where your knee line is, how your body weights distribute. There's nothing by accident. Johnny has faults, but he also has really great positives. I think Henzo, when he was into teaching, he doesn't really teach at all anymore. When he was into teaching, you asked me this question earlier about the so much came out of that. You know, there's that saying that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. It really doesn't. He was everything. If you get to meet Henzo, he's this warm, charming person, never forgets your name, gives you a big hug. Like just this really great charismatic guy. Like but he was also so passionate about teaching every detail to these young guys coming up. Matt Sarah, Hicard Almeida, John Danaher, Sean Williams, like he was really insane. So when I say great instructor, I think there's many. I don't know them all. 
hopefully they're, they're a mixture of everything because not everybody's going to absorb BJJ on the same level. Some people might have the athletic ability. Sometimes minds do whatever way, it's just, they just don't absorb it. They just can't remember the moves. They can't sequence them fast enough. It's like, hey, you're not going to teach me certain languages. I'm, I'm not good at that. But BJJ, I see the game a little bit different. Hopefully those things are combined in one person, but there's many great ones out there. And I think that the bottom line is if they can give the encouragement to come, get on the mat, be a positive influence, be a good role model, create this environment of positivity. To me, that's where it starts in being a great instructor. And then if you can put technique together, knowing how to motivate each individual, some people might need a little bit of a good push, might call it the whip. Some might need words of encouragement and a pat on the back. That instructor needs to know which one is which. Hopefully you can encompass that in one person. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes as they're all men and women, we all have shortcomings. So hopefully it starts with the thing I said in the beginning, that there's this positive influence that creates this positive environment that encourages somebody to come and get on the mat, whether they become a champion or not. I mean, so many different factors in that. So it starts with the positivity and the role model and the words of encouragement. And if you haven't seen them on the mat, send them a text. And you haven't seen you. You know, it's easy to fall out of a habit. It's hard to create one. But if, if a good instructor stays on his students and pushes them, hopefully that's where it starts yeah, for me. Just a reminder, please give us a five-star review on Apple Music and Spotify and become a VIP member for only 99 cents a month. Get ad-free episodes at anchor.fm forward slash forever white belt forward slash subscribe. And check us out on Instagram at forever white belt show. Go buy your forever white belt swag at teespring, T-E-E spring.com forward slash forever dash white dash belt. Check us out on YouTube now at forever white belt. Finally, if you ever get to beautiful Northern California, please come roll with us at North Bay Jiu-Jitsu in Marin County, just north of San Francisco. There are amazing instructors and everyone there are great people. Mention the podcast and get two weeks free. How did you evolve to get to the point you are when we hear things about like Matrix Mike and Killer Mike and when you were talking about the early days of Henzo's where you guys would just, you know, everyone was just mauling each other to this person here that's saying, you know, you you need to be emotionally intelligent and to fluctuate uh, your observations of students, you know, basically your evolution as a teacher. It started with the technical aspect for me because I, I was fortunate enough to have John. There's many things that I teach that he never taught me that I either saw somewhere or developed on my own through years of just being on the mat. That happens for every instructor, every individual. So that's where it started for me. And then the evolution came for many different things. I was fortunate enough to have some really great role models in my life that called me out when I did things that were short of being a good human being. So if I had to give credit to uh, people It would be that I was fortunate enough to have high-level instruction, fortunate to have an environment where this was cultivated, and then tie into that I just had some really, really awesome individuals in my life. They were older mentors, and I had many. And then as anybody in life, you have tragedies and hardships that occur. I was fortunate enough to take those and use them as tools to improve as a person. And And I don't regret any of them. Anything that's ever happened that's maybe viewed as a negative, I don't view it as a negative. I view it as this amazing learning lesson that's brought me to the stage right now where I feel so fortunate in everything I have. Like, every, anybody asks me, like, how you doing? I go, dude, I'm freaking amazing. I feel great. Like, uh, shout out to something, though, that I just got stem cells in, Com- in Colombia. If anybody wants to contact me, I just did a double dose of the uh, stem cells IV and I did my shoulder. I've been doing VJJ 25 years. I have an ache and pain at every single disc, knee, elbow. It's just part of the game, especially coming up. I told that story is like no one knew who John Danaher was. And people used to say, hey, you should go to Henzo's classes. Maybe you get your black belt. And I was like, no, I'm going to get my black belt from John Danaher. No one knew who he was. And we were like, who is that? And I'd go, man, I'm going to kick your ass when I'm done. Uh, because I wanted to spread Johnny's name. It's funny how it turned out. But uh, I, I just had amazing, amazing role models. And then a bunch of hardships and tough things. that, Like, thankfully, I told this story before about the grind of BJJ and teaching his perseverance and never giving up. And it's such truth. Somebody's always trying to pass your guard. You try to fight to recover. Somebody takes you down. You try to fight to get back up. And it starts to get ingrained in you. I always recommend that if somebody has a child, 
try your best. Don't push them to do it. Don't force them. Hopefully they come to it. But it's a great way to just build this character within them. So that's how the evolution happened. And then I, when Johnny left, they asked me if I would take over. And I did. I said, man, you know, I was kind of on the fence about it. Uh, but I absolutely love it. I love being able to give back to these young men. I have a bunch of them. They're about two years in right now. If you come to the morning class or any of those classes where they're there, they're mauling guys that are like 15, 17, 18 year in black belts. Like they just live on the mats. I don't know which ones will want to compete long term, but they're just young kids. They literally live on the mats training all the time. They're the next versions of what we were. But that's where I just love giving back to people. For those with the not the best ankles and, and the knees and that are getting stem cell shots and et cetera, how can we play no gi effectively? What is your suggestion for the, the middle-aged grappler? For the middle-aged grappler and also for the gentleman that, uh, that maybe isn't the middle-aged grappler, for years I was always told that no, gi was more technical than no gi. And uh, I just, I didn't really have an opinion on it. I just assumed they're right. But as the game has evolved, the Nogi game is just way more technical because every micro wedge, every position of a, a limb, an angle of a body part, because you have no physical grip, you're basically trying to grab this wet fish. So you have to be so detailed with everything and how you grip things, how your perspective is on angles. And so... If I could make a suggestion is that you can get away with a lot of stuff with a gi, a lot. I mean, you have this fabric to grab and all these things that you could do with a belt and a lapel. And, and it's fun. I actually enjoy playing gi also. Uh, but if I had a suggestion, and, and this is going to go kind of technical on it, is that as you're playing the game, you want to understand that every single body part from your foot position to your knee position to your weight position, head position, hand position, where your elbows are flared, your angle of your body, everything has a purpose. Nothing is by accident. Absolutely nothing. So you want to start asking yourself, whatever your game may be, whatever stage, start asking yourself reverse engineered questions. What would happen because you want to understand that guy's reactions and movements even more than you understand your physical move. So you'll deep dive even deeper into the game. It'll actually help your gi game. I see it right now with so many guys that are older right now that I'm, I'm convincing, hey, come on over here. And now they're going back to gi and they're just mauling people because they almost feel like they're cheating. That they have to, You mean I can grab fabric? This is incredible. This is so much easier. So I recommend that if you're thinking about it and you've been doing the game for a bit, that even what you said about ankles and knees and heels and stuff, always first thing first is always tap the moment you feel any type of danger. Don't work out. Don't try to fight out of stuff. Unless you know physical, technical escapes, tap. And then take a look at the move. Understand like what was the position? What did he do? How would I technically escape? And start thinking of the game in a deeper aspect. Most of the game is taught. This is most of the game. You watch YouTube and you watch Instagram and the guy will show this move and people will go, wow, that's some move, man. I got to drill that or do it. And almost every single move, the guy doesn't move. The guy literally stays there as he does the move. That's never going to occur ever. That is never going to occur. So you want to ask yourself, if I attempted this move, what would he do? And not just what would he do? Where would his left arm go? Potentially, his left arm is probably going to have like three different angles. Where would his right kneecap go? Kneecap might have two angles. Where would he be doing with his left foot? What would he be doing with his body line in his head? And you start getting such such a deep knowledge of the game and almost reverse engineering because you buy these DVDs, right? And then these DVDs are all like, so you do this and you do this and you do this. And what does he do? He literally stays there like a puppet and doesn't move. It doesn't occur. It doesn't, never occurs in the game. So you want to start understanding. I'm not giving you the best answer because it's not that easy to do. Unfortunately, I mean, no disrespect to anybody that's watching that teaches the game. But most places you go, I would say they've never thought of the game in those angles. They've been taught the game as an application. You know, you go, I, I couldn't apply the move. He got out. Okay, so how did he get out? And they go, I don't know. He just turned. No, he just didn't turn. He did multiple things. He had four limbs and a head and he had hips and how far were his hips. So you start going such deep diving into the game. For the older person, this is a question that somebody DM me today. And um, I guess they're visiting New York and they say, hey man, 
I've been watching your Happy Tool project and I love it, but it's so it's so high level that I'm a little lost and intimidated. And I was thinking to myself, gosh, one of the things about that class is that every Monday and Wednesday and Friday, there's 80 people in there. So I can go so deep into technical aspects of the game because I pick up where I left off. So they start to understand like all these nuances of every reaction, every movement. There's nothing random. I hate when people say, oh, you just create a scramble. Are you serious? Like, that's what you think? Like, no, you know, this is everything matters. Like, even at the highest level, you know, I mean, no disrespect to, because I think Pedro Marino's an amazing player. Yeah, Nargali submitted Pedro Marino probably like two minutes or something like that, right? It was really quick. But if you watch Paige Marino fight Gordon Ryan and then watch Paige Marino fight Gene Carlo and Greg Jones, he beats both of them. And then watch, if you once you watch those two, then watch Gordon fight Paige Marino. Watch those three fights. Gordon wrote down what he was going to do to him. He was going to smother him, which kind of is what he did to the hillbilly hammer, smother him. It's not really a submission, almost like, semi kind of embarrassment you're not supposed to tap on pressure but he was trying to at about 26 minutes a 30 minute match he obviously was not going to tap from smother right he wasn't going to tap from simple pressure johnny said to him hey gordon you only got four minutes you gotta submit him now he said okay i'll submit him now and that's how it was it was within one minute he finished him and I'm, we're getting off the topic for a second but reason i bring that up is that it's not by accident it's like Gordon understands the game. He's not only a great competitor, but he also is an amazing instructor and has an amazing, like Johnny, I have to say, Johnny spent more time with him than me because he literally has taught that young man every reactionary sequence from offensive and defensive that the read and reactions, Gordon's not an Uber athlete at all. Like I think Nicky Rodriguez, if he didn't, kick up BJJ and maybe somebody else gave him some different direction when he was younger, I think he'd probably be playing tight end in the NFL. Like usually guys like that are six, four that move like that are like, they're not, they're either playing in the NFL or some professional league. They don't take up BJJ. Gordon would have not made it. Like Gordon probably would have played division three football, but his understanding and reactions are so deep that he reads and reacts better than anybody. So he has a shortcut. I'm going to go back to where your question was. How would a guy like start getting into no gi and want to play it at a high level? Because it'll also help your gi game. Is start to ask yourself those questions. Start to ask like when you're deep diving and you're drilling with a friend, like start asking like, just don't apply the move. You can watch TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. That's you, you Google guillotines, arm bars, you probably, if I said I need you to get me 1,000 videos on arm bars today, you'd probably come back with 1,000 videos by the end of the day and all different variations and probably 950 of them would suck. And about the other 50 that would be really high caliber, you have to understand the reactions of the other person because the person will just drill the move. But within the move, there's escapes. And there's probably six or seven escapes. And there's probably about six kazushis where he off balances you. And you have to know the sequences and how to follow. Because you, you're only going to take what your partner gives you. And then you're going to follow him off of that. So that's how I would recommend somebody getting into it. Is if you really want to get into it and you love the sport. Because if a person's been playing the game and they've gotten to Purple Belt and they want to start getting into the Noki game like really deep dive into it. it's the beauty of the art. That's why I say it's has nothing to do with fighting, but it revolves around fighting. It's getting so deep mentally into the game. We are like, man, this is like this fascinating hobby of these moving chess pieces that I have to read and react within quarter seconds, depending on if a tilt, the game changes within four inches, within three to four inches, the game is totally different. So sometimes people say, professor, I couldn't do the move. And then they'll show me the, where the position was on the hip. And I go, that's not the move anymore. And I go, what do you mean? You should show the move. I go, no, no, no. The move left already. That, that They move four inches. For just four inches. Three to four. It's a game's totally different. So I, I recommend going deep diving into the game in a backwards level. I mentioned this thing about the DM. And I got off track for a second. Uh, somebody mentioned about visiting and said, hey, this is like too advanced for me. Um, Henzo's is opening a second place up. And they asked me if I would help build a program up. 
And uh, so I said, yeah, I think I will. I said, let me get back to you. I have, I, one of the things I've been fortunate of is I've been a businessman outside of BJJ. So a lot of the stuff that I do with this thing called the happy pill, and we'll get into it, is I can give away all this knowledge for free. And I don't need to generate income from DVDs or any of that stuff. It's just to help people. So what I'd like to do is create this no gi program where it starts in its infant stages and understanding all of the basics and technical aspects of things you want to accomplish offensively and defensively. So it just got put in my head today because that I've gotten a bunch of those DMs. We're like, man, it's really hard for me to understand because I'm not at that level yet to look at the state, look at the game in a different perspective. So I tell people just hang in there because I'm starting to hear that more and more. And I'd love for more and more guys getting up in age or, or just, you know, this is you get, you said this as we started, you said, man, in the beginning, it was hard for me to go, you know, wasn't sure, like kind of nervous about it. And that's how it is with Guy. It's like you get into this academy and you finally had the courage to get in the room. And now, okay, you're in your white belt room. You, you start to develop friends. Like you get in these good, like good group of guys. You guys enjoy trailing. You enjoy seeing each other. And then there's that next thing. You're like, man, all the young, terrifying bucks are in the room over there with no tops and bottoms. I don't know if I, I don't want to go in there. I'm a little bit nervous. And I want to eliminate that. I want to simplify the game so that a person can go in there and understand like, you don't have to get leg locked. You get leg locked because of your foot positions are off. Your knee lines are off. You gave him that. You didn't take it from you because you've been taught the game in this unrealistic manner, wearing this gi top and bottoms and your legs are dangling all over the place. So when you go into the no gi, he didn't take it from you. You just fundamentally were off. And if your fundamentals were off, because of the leg lock, you were fundamentally off in other positions. The game doesn't lie. It marries from front and back beautifully. So it's exactly the same. It's balanced. It's almost like a Libra scale. It's beautifully balanced. If you're off on one side, you're off on the other. So you're taught this game that you can get away with grabbing some fabric. You can get away with doing some things where you hold somebody by a belt buckle or whatever it may be, like a pant leg. A p- and now your leg lock positions are off, but they don't take your leg, right? Because in IBJJ settings, reverse heel hooks are illegal. Heel hooks are illegal, and which is the dumbest thing in the world. And people will say to me, what do you mean? The person can't escape because he's got a deep bottom on. Okay, but then the argument becomes, so why do we wear these tops and bottoms? And then the, the first response is because in the street, people wear jeans and they wear jackets. Okay, so the time that they decide to tear your, your knee apart in some manner, are you going to take off your pants and tell them time out for a second? You're not. It, it's almost like uh, the whole thing with the reaping. That is so, it's the dumbest thing in the world. Like, you're not allowed to reap, right? Okay, so I'm not allowed to reap. So you know what would happen if I couldn't reap? If somebody was on top of me, if I don't get to reap and make him look the other way, he would rain down the biggest right hand to my face. And everything that I thought about me grabbing a pant leg, a belt, a belt, a jacket, literally the moment his fist hit my nose, my eyes would balloon up. I would let go of everything. And now his second face is in my face again. And probably I'm dead because my head would hit the concrete and I'd be knocked out. So I would love the game to change a bit. I'm not recommending that all of a sudden they add heel hooks because people's knees would get torn apart with the gi, but it all goes back to like really understanding this game and like every aspect of it. The thing I said earlier about your knee positions will be off. No one takes legs. Like if if the thing is that, you know, I'm a little bit scared about legs and stuff. Yeah, no, but all of your positions are off on your knee. No one takes legs. Like they take legs because you'd left them dangling that you left them in positions that are just so unrealistic. So I'm getting off track because I'm, I'm marrying a bunch of things up at one time, but I would like to show that stuff in the future to help people that potentially I don't see in the city and they don't come to Penzo's that maybe I can open up some eyes. And it's a beautiful community. You know, years ago is like your school was against my school. I don't look at that like that. I look at it as like, man, you play BJJ, good for you. You know, you're enriching your life. You're probably in some manner, uh, helping your your mental outlook. Uh, you're probably a better dad from it. You're a better role model. You're a better husband. It improves the quality of life in so many manners, the game. 
So, Mike, a lot to unpack there, one of which is, and I've heard you mention this before, and it's sort of the old trope uh, in gi jiu-jitsu is like, I like playing gi because it, I can slow the guy down. I've heard you before in the past mention, you can slow people down in no gi, but how? Um, usually. Um, people will not play a four to three principle. And this is what I mean by it, is that you have two legs, which could be butterflies or uh, some form of delahivas, reverse delahiva, Z guard. Uh, maybe they're just the butterflies are inside. You also have two arms, right? You have two hands. You also have a head. As long as you understand that you're constantly playing this three to four principle, most people play a four to two or a three to two or three to one. This is what I mean by it. You should have four points of contact always, right? So if you have four points of contact, you had maybe your both insteps were connected, but I mean really connected. I don't mean like they're lazily sitting between the person's legs. That's number one. That, that you see in every school. They clap hands and right away their feet positions are just laying between the guy's legs. Your legs are tools to grab and use. Whether you're grabbing with two arches on one kneecap, which if the leg flares up becomes a reverse delahiva, depends where he stands. Like I don't want to get too crazy technical because I'll lose people on this description. Your hand positions. I'll see people grab the back of the tricep, maybe they're grabbing the guy's forearm. Like I'm trying to grab very strategic points to manipulate body parts that manipulate movement. So preferably I can control the elbow lines because if I can control the elbows and I can control the rotation of the elbow, then I control the shoulder that controls the rest of the movement of the body. So now I said to you before, four to three, four to two, three to one, so at any point, if I randomly grab most, most even mo a good portion of black belts too, if I grab any purple belt, brown belt, you'll see them drop from four to two. So hypothetically, they might be grabbing two elbows and they got two insteps. So they have four points of contact. And then the head position's a variable because the head position, I do want to win head position, but I never want him to win head position. If his head position wins, I have to get out of that pocket. His head position should never lay on my chest line. It's all the principles of like uh, of passing, uh, body lock passing, uh, half guard, tripod pass. They all have the same, basically the same principle is that they won head position within my chest line. I can't ever allow that. So I would love to ha I win head position as the bottom player or the top player. But if I'm the bottom player and he's winning head position, I have to leave because that's the essence of body lock passing. Many, many things. I don't get too crazy technical with this, but that if I've decided to create an offensive move, what you want to do is move one of those four tools to the next sequence before you drop one of the... So let's hypothetically say you were going to a shoulder clamp. So let's say we started with two butterflies and I had two elbows. Pretty basic standard position. And we're not even going to say that the bottom player moves. We're just, I mean, the top player. I'm the bottom player. He's a top player, right? I'm not even going to say that, that he moved. Let's say I decide to take, I'm going to use my left hand to lace it underneath his armpit to grab the back of his shoulder. And now what I would love to do is take my right hand and clamp my hands together so that I dominate his right shoulder. At some point, what will happen is I would have loved when I laced my hand through to take full command of the back shoulder. I would have four points of contact. And now I would drop one of my positions, whether it now we're going to say what we just said is both my hands are going to pair up. So I would drop my far side right hand to bring it to my left. If you watch the game and you're coaching it, what you'll hear yelled is you got a dead limb. And they'll go, what do you, what, what did you mean? I go, you got a dead limb. And they'll go, I don't understand what you're saying. And they'll go, your right butterfly just dropped. And they'll go, but I'm going for a clamp. And I go, no, 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 no. You just went from four to two and you lost connection. And that's why you got passed. So in a really slow motion setting and how we said the game changes in a quarter second. 90% of the time, something will go dead on you. And now you went from four to two. So it may be that you lost connection of one butterfly. Initially, we thought we were going to go left hand through the pocket to grab the back of the shoulder. That created four clamp. That became four position grab. Now I drop my far side right hand to come over the top. 90% of the people will drop their butterflies and they will not have full contact. So I am constantly 
and full awareness of how his hips are tilting. Because I may elevate him to my right side or left side. I may recollect the head and bring him on top of me. I may decide to bring him high to attack his legs. But I've never dropped a four to two contact or a four to one. Early in somebody's career, if a coach hasn't repeatedly shown them and called it out on them, they'll start realizing like, holy shit, I have a dead lip. And when I tell you, an awful, we're talking about guys that are still, I don't want to name names, but guys that are still fighting in the UFC, like really well-known guys where like they'll send me video and I'll go, they fight in the PFL, you, you, World's, um, Bellator, uh, guys are still competing. I'll go, you got passed. Look at the, we'll timestamp things. So in a six minute match, I have a young lady who just won ADCC Open. She won the absolute. She got the $25 prize. So she'll send me a video. So we'll timestamp every single thing. And this is a good way for like a, somebody just starting out to do. So that, let's say the 10 minute match. So you go to the 10 minute match and then you ask them like, okay, tell me everything you did wrong. And then they'll go through it and they'll go, okay, at 9.58, I dropped from a four to two. My right leg came down. I missed that De La Hiva. I didn't grab his ankle. And then at maybe 9.31, what happened here? And this, this literally would be like 25 different sequences that were off. And then we'll go back and break them out and then circle them and break them out. These are all things that Johnny used to do too. But the question I think was um, slowing down the game. Yeah. So that's usually how the, why the game will happen. And the, and the slowdown never happens is because the points of contact have been dropped that you've allowed this man to move. Because if whether, let's say I'm in a, a Z guard and I'm controlling limbs and it's kind of hard for me to, like if I could show it, it'd be great. Um, there's many ways from Z guard to uh, butterflies to, and I don't really like playing closed guard in Nogi. I think it's kind of antiquated. I think it's great for fighting. I, I really do. I think for real, real fighting, it's great. You, with the leg lock game, it's so dangerous. And even in, now when I say fighting, inexperienced fighting, uh, UFC fighting, not, not good. You know, and in real, real fighting, not good also. Like if the guy's a high level striker, you'll get eaten alive in a closed guard. Uh, the game has evolved too much that people know how to separate their hands, how to come up with open hands. Like it's evolved too much. And in a real, real fight, if the guy's super experienced, like that's also not a good position. And gi, I think it's fantastic position because of the, the possibilities with the lapel and the chokes. Uh, but the, it's, it's dangerous. Like playing a closed guard game with a high level leg locker, like the moment you move open up, the, if he gets you open, there's an opportunity for him right away. And then what are you going to tell me? You're going to tell me you're going to arm bar him? I mean, the game's evolved past that point. Like, unless the guy falls asleep and he can't follow your hip lines, like, that's not real. And, you know, people always laugh at me when I say, oh, that's not real. That's, not, that's like 2005. <laughs> like, the yeah, game's evolved a bit. So you bring up closed guard. One of these things, you know, I've spoke before with a few other practitioners, and they, um, and they talk about things, that, you know, they call it dogma, right? This dogma that used to work Probably in the gi, that doesn't work so great in uh, no gi. And I'm curious, besides closed guard, are there other things? I've heard people mention things like a uh, reverse de la Hiva, not so great in no gi. Deep half, also very dangerous no gi. Your thoughts on any other sort of dogma? I think reverse de la Hiva for no gi is great. Now, when we say reverse de la Hiva, there's three different ways to look at this. There's sport BJJ, right? Sport. There's sport. I, I think it's great for sport. And for many reasons, is like, depending on whether he's sitting or standing, if he's sitting, hypothetically, let's say you have a double grip on one ankle with both of your insteps. Okay, so he's sitting in front of you and you've taken both of your feet and attached them to one of his kneecaps, which if he picks that leg up, that becomes a reverse de la Hiva. So technically, if he picks that leg up and it goes to a reverse de la Hiva, the only way that leg can go aerial is if he puts all his balancing on the far side kneecap. So the weight distribution goes to the other kneecap. So the De La Hiva becomes an ankle pick that turns into you either reaping or butterflying back in. Or in, I mean, Marcelo in one of those ADCCs made that elevator sweep so popular. That was all off for reverse De La Hiva and then ankle grabbing and then rocking him back. Like, But the game's evolved to those leg locks now. So that potentially could happen. It also allows you on that reverse De La Hiva that picks up that leg 
for you to do a couple of other reversals off of that grip. That Delaheva also, potentially, because if he brings the leg up, the weight distribution goes to the other side. But, but the timing has to be correct. And your hand positions on the grabs of the upper body have to be correct. So there's a combination of things that are happening. Also, the reverse Delaheva, I, I think, is underutilized in standing. When the person's standing in front of you, because I think the best player to ever play the game was Hoffa Mendez. The level of sequencing was so deep that and then you get to see it with uh with that young man Cole Abate. I'm a huge fan of his I, I, yeah I think he's a spectacular young man in a bright future to come in front of him it's so dependent on lateral movement that you're running into a problem and that you're basically sitting on your ass or your back and this young man's moving laterally back and forth knee cutting a back stepping like getting two behind one sprawl passing all these things. The essence of the game that we talked about for the older gentlemen was slowing down the game against these guys that are more athletic faster. How can you slow the game down without that reverse Delaheva? Because I want to get points of contact. So if I'm not throwing that reverse Delaheva, and when I say reverse Delaheva, you're not leaving it out in the air. You're literally latching on the reverse Delaheva to yank him in to get him on top of you because the essence of reversing is kazushin is putting a man's balance. What's the essence of like a deep, basic BJJ 101 is a deep half guard reversal. That's like basic BJJ 101, what move they teach you from the very beginning. is basically you getting underneath that the balancing of his weight becomes super light that you can potentially reverse him over. Anything that you decide to do, whether it be arm drags, whether you be to slow down the game, you have to lock up the one of the legs. You, I'm not a fan because on a Delaheva, it's not the same uh, with a Delaheva with Nogi. It's too dangerous. It, that one, because he can spin and leave me and then go. Then when he turns around, he's going lateral and he has a larger range of motion from standing, but he's more athletic. I have a shorter radius on my turns, but I'm slower because I'm sitting on my ass. Your question, how can you slow the game down? Going back to the reverse Delaheva, it's critical. It's critical because you're either going to have one of two things. So slow the game down, whether you want to call it a Z guard, a Z guard, okay. So the Delaheva technically is looking the other way. It's still the same thing. It's you gripping your foot position behind his kneecap and, and hamstring, still the same thing. So you still, no matter what, whether it be a Z guard set, and what is deep half guard? 90% of the time when they teach how you half guard is you playing some type of Z guard that you got your arm underneath his armpit and then shot underneath. Still technically the essence of where it all started together. It's the same foundational piece. So the reverse Del Heva, I think, uh, is very good for Nogi. I'm not a big fan of the outside one. I, I am a fan of the false reap. Only thing with the false reap is like it's not realistic for real fighting. If a gentleman's a bit older, like don't like don't incorporate that in your game. Like you want the essence of your game to be able to defend yourself in a street fight. You want the essence of your game to be applicable, whether an offensive or defensive set. You're gonna get older. You're gonna go into a false reap reinverting. How much time do you think your spinal cord has? So I only revert this question back because. We were talking about masters and older gentlemen getting into nogi. Don't waste your time doing that. Like, if you want to have some success in false reaping, great. How do you think that's going to go down with somebody above you and you're trying to false reap on concrete? You can only incorporate so many things. Johnny famously told me one time, he said, be careful. And I said, in what way? And he said, when you adopt, you drop. If you ever realize, like anybody, you watch, sit and watch somebody roll. And the moment they get tired, they'll do the same thing over and over. And the moment they get even more tired, that little sequence will get tighter and tighter. It's how the mind works for everybody, right? It becomes maybe 9 to 11 moves. And then within those 9 to 11, you could have variation. But as the game gets, like you get more fatigued, your mind gets more narrow in its thinking, the game, you start to dropping things, right? You start to get, now start playing a five to seven game. Now it gets to leave even more. And then you start doing the same thing over and over and over. It comes the same principle is be careful in what you add, because when you add something, you drop something. I don't care if you tell me that you think that you know it. Yeah, take it out live when you need to go live. It's not going to come out of you. Also, I want to point something out to the people that are at all different stages of their game. And maybe they're the masters purple, or maybe they are brown, or they're just starting their journey. 
question the things you adopt because you want a fluid, beautiful game. If your game, hypothetically, let's say you love deep half guard from one position or a certain pass, that you love to pass on your right side with a sprawl, marry it to something on the left side. It doesn't have to be the same move, but you want to marry things that blend the game really beautifully as this artistic flow. So be careful in the things you adopt and drop, the things that you're considering, the things that maybe you've been taught that you have this false reap and a far side drag on the other arm, but you false reap on one Those things don't marry. So every time that you fail on one side, you have to totally mechanically reset into a different position to attempt the other move. The game should flow beautifully. When it's done right, it's like, it's so beautiful to watch because nothing's forced and everything is a flow pattern off of your person's reactions within four inches. Damn, I wish I had another hour with you. But I'd be remiss if I don't bring up the the Happy Pill Project. I know that this came up uh, for several reasons. I know a couple of which is that we've had such a fentanyl crisis within the country, probably globally, actually, and that we've been losing so many people. And um, you've released uh, this thing called the Happy Pill Project. Can you expand on that and all this free BJJ? I mean, high level stuff. And I was actually gonna ask you, you know, where's your instructionals and all this stuff? Then I, find, I stumble on the Happy Pill Project. And I'm like, holy hell, here, here's everything. I was invited to do some seminars and uh, I had a couple of times when I've been at these seminars, these young men have come up to me and told me that they were suicidal and they found BJJ and one young man, the reason he's at a certain university was because his family found this BJJ school that he could be near and he could do BJJ and it changed his life and his perspective on how he viewed things and it became his happy pill. And that's what I continuously heard, especially during covid so many young people, older people, unsure of where things were going. And, and over the years, I've seen it over and over where it's transformed people's outlooks on life. And everybody, if you play BJJ, there's times where you just walk in and you're like wondering like, damn, this is like really a tough day. You go roll with your friends and you walk out and you go, what was I really worried about? Was that really that important? Like, And it just gives you a different perspective. And what I found is that BJJ is people's happy pill. For many, these people that I mentioned, and I also, I have a partner, his name is Ethan. Everybody knows Ethan Seamless. He was at a job for 14 years and I'm a fifth degree black belt. And when I got my fifth degree, a bunch of the guys wanted to take me out to, um, to breakfast. And uh, I said to him, I said, hey, why don't you come? And he said, man, I would love to. And I said, I wish you could, but you got to go to work. And he said, no, 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 I quit last night. And I said, what do you mean you quit last night? And he said, I quit last night. And I thought he was kidding. And he said, no, I actually, I talked to my wife last night and I've been at this, doing the same thing for 14 years. I don't want to do it anymore. It just is really depressing. And, you know, I want to do something different. And I thought to myself, he, well, he ended up coming, but I thought to myself, man, I would love to help him. I would love to help him find something that he would be passionate about, that he would love to do. Because he told me, he goes, I want to do something that I love. He's crazy about BJJ. He actually teaches now the Nogi class up at Middletown Henzo Gracie. But that came together with a couple of other people and me wanting to just keep trying to help people find this art, trying to somehow touch more people and bring more people into it. And that's how I created. So it started with just us, like them filming my morning class and us posting it and just free knowledge. Like I don't want anything for it. Through that, I've done a bunch of other charities. I've been working with Weedify. It's the first organization, if people don't know what Weedify is, what they do is uh, they have about 800 people on scholarship. And what they do is if you test 80 and above in the post-traumatic stress disorder, they don't call it that. I think they call it co combat stress disorder. Or I feel, I'm actually, I'm messing up with their description of it, but they don't use the term PTSD anymore. So if they score high enough on it, what they do is they try to put a person in a BJJ school that's within 30 minutes of their house. They buy them two geese and they pay for one year tuition, which is on average $2,500. So I've gotten involved in that and with the happy pill and just giving this knowledge away for free because you know this in the beginning, you're the nail. Everybody's beating you up. But as you start having some success and that could be minimal, that sometimes doesn't mean me submitting somebody. That might mean that every time this guy submitted me, this time he didn't. Or this may be that every time somebody got me inside control, I couldn't get out, but today I did. 
So I look at it like success is determined in so many different ways. What the Happy Pill tries to do is it's been doing a bunch of fundraisers. And if anybody out there wants to contact me about doing one, we've been paying for our own tuition. We've been trying to raise money for Weedify because I think it's just a great organization. 800 people on scholarship. Everybody's a volunteer. They're three paid employees. One of them is like this media guy. The other guy's the accountant. Like everybody's a volunteer. They're all veterans all trying to make a difference. So if anyone ever wants to do one of the events, try to raise, I always say, hey, let's just go there with the goal of raising $2,500 to get one more guy in a scholarship. I know some of it is a bit advanced, but if you watch the happy pill, I try to link everything together. So if you watch one episode and you go right to the next one, it links together where I do a recap on what I showed I also show every reactionary detail that they could possibly do. Some of it's a bit advanced. I don't think for probably your audience, but for somebody maybe starting out in white belt or or that, is I said this earlier, that I'm going to try to create something like that for the person just starting out to give them some cool drills and stuff for them to do on their own. I've been fortunate enough to have some success outside of BJJ financially that it allows me that I don't, I'm just trying to help people. Like if I can continue doing that, it's so art's so beautiful. It's some of the best people you've ever meet, the bonds you make, the friends you make. Such a great thing. If anybody is watching it that has never done BJJ, I would recommend one million percent to find a good school, a good encouraging environment. One of the questions you asked me earlier was, what makes a great instructor? The great instructor starts with the environment the environment that they create, the positive energy, and then the technique and the teachings, they can all come later. That's number one. Anybody ever visiting in New York that wants to stop by at the main academy, my schedule that I teach there, Saturdays, there's two rooms in the basement. They're massive rooms. I actually have to split the room up. Both rooms are packed. And then I have to run back and forth and I have to get everybody to run back to the same room. And people come from all over on Saturdays. You'll have, you'll see a guy, you'll see Chesma, you'll see Jared Gore, you'll see Megastar, you'll see that guy, Patty Pimble, the guys just starting out. So I always recommend come, like you want to take pictures, walk the academy, uh, please introduce yourself. Like I just love BJJ and it doesn't matter what stage you are. That story I said, hey, like Bitcoin, you get in when you get in. You're never too old. Never think that. I have people that have started in their 60s and a gentleman, I think, that is close right now, close to 70. And he's loving it. He's on the mat and, and success is determined any way you want. It doesn't matter if you don't tap them. Maybe you just defend guard that day. Maybe you just got up and got on the mat and that's success. Well, how about all these babies getting into it now, Mike, globally now? The next stage of the game is uh, what you're seeing now is the homeschool child that has been doing BJJ 14. You see what Colabate, the Rotolo brothers, Nico Gaval, they've been homeschooled, been doing BJJ every day. The Tackett brothers, that's the next stage of competitive athlete. So, Mike, uh, hard left turn here. How'd you learn to tie your belt? (laughs) That's a great question. So many different people have showed me the different ways to tie it, but uh, I'd have to say Johnny did. Yeah, Johnny. I, and I yeah. love I love the yeah. fact that you call John Danaher Johnny. I would be terrified to call him Johnny, or I don't think anyone oh, would. Funny, because I if I text him, <laughs> I'll write, "Hey, Sensei," but I always refer to him the same way, Johnny. Johnny, can I ask you a question, Johnny? Can I ask you a question? He's a amazing, amazing instructor. Amazing. And uh, super excited for his next day. I know he's trying to create a young female champion. I think he's got one that's like killing the brackets. Oh, now. Helena Cravar. Yeah, um, that's right. Uh huh. Yeah, she was yeah. on the show. You know, Mike, I, I noticed that you have uh, one other instructional. It's called Advanced Smash Passing, I believe. I didn't, there's a reason they charge for that. And I'll be really honest with it. I didn't want it. Those young men, they're from Penn State. They wrestled at Penn State. And through the happy pill, they kept contacting me and trying to get me to do something. I just really tried. I I don't really care if I ever see a dollar of it. I don't even know if, I know they're charging for it, but I'm just so impressed that these young men are basically 21, 22 years old, and they're trying to go head to head with, I guess, fanatics BJJ or fanatics something. Yeah, yeah. And hey, a lot of people are yeah. good for them, so you know? I, and when you talk to them, I forget they're in a Geno's, one of them. Their company is called Ocean or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's in beta right now. So there are a couple of young kids that just graduated from Penn State. They wrestled on the team. I know how hard it is to start off in the beginning in business. And you're this young guy, you're trying to figure out. So I was just so impressed with them. 
and how they tried to pitch me. And even when I didn't want to do it, they still pitched me some more. So I was just like, I don't, whatever works out for them. So if I you need Mike, that's the trick, you guys. Just nag him to death, you know what I mean? He'll, <laughs> he'll cave in eventually. Yeah. So Mike, if the listener or viewer wants to get more information about you, where can they do that? I would recommend going on the Happy Pill Project. It's on YouTube. You can also DM me on uh, Mike Jaramillo BJJ on Instagram. I usually will DM them back and give them my, my cell phone because I do respond to text messages right away. Instagram, I don't go on that often. So sometimes if somebody DM me, don't think I'm ignoring it. I just, I didn't grow up in social media and I do so many different things that it's not that often that I go on IG and start looking things up. So just hold out. I, I actually will return the message though. Okay, everyone, we will add all of that in the show notes and all the details for Mike and, and all his work and everything. And I'm your host, Adolfo Fronda. Thanks everyone for watching and listening another week. This is Forever White Belt. We appreciate your time. Consider becoming a VIP member and giving us the thumbs up and the subscribes and everything everywhere. All right. So Mike, thank you so much for your time so gracious i can't can't wait for part two let's do it again thank you very much brother appreciate it take care all right thanks everyone see you guys